Right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, call of the Crypto Oracle Collective. We've got a, a very special guest with us today, uh, Matthew Siegel, head of digital assets for Van Eck. Um, but before uh, I turn the floor over to Matthew, just want to mention a couple quick uh, things uh, coming up at the collective. Um, the first is uh, we have a conference call tomorrow. Um, one of our clients, uh, uh, Swarm, uh, uh, has a bonding curve vote coming up in their community. And bonding curves are actually something I've always kind of had an interest in. Um, and so we're holding a webinar on bonding curve uh, tomorrow. I'll put a link in if anybody here is uh, similarly interested in, in bonding curves. Uh, last I checked, we had uh, 38 RSVPs and uh, a lot more coming. So uh, there is some interest in bonding curve. Should be, you know, for those interested, a good call. Um, and then I remind everybody that today is the last week uh, that we'll be accepting applications for the AI Web3 accelerators. Uh, we've got over 30 great uh, applications already, uh, more coming in. So, you know, very happy with how that's going, but uh, still making a big effort the last week to get as many great projects uh, to apply as possible. Um, you know, we generally start uh, these calls uh, with um, uh, any new members on the call, but there are a few new members. We have actually have some business at the end if we do have some time. So we're going to skip that uh, this uh, uh, this call. Uh, we'll definitely do it the next call. Um, and uh, with that, you know, I'd, I'd like to turn the floor over to our you know special guest, as yeah, everybody knows <laughs> on the call, um, probably the biggest thing that's happened in uh, the crypto universe uh, so far in 2024 is the launch of the of the Bitcoin ETFs, um, really bringing, you know, I think a, a lot of us feel a, a, a kind of different level, new, higher level of respectability than than we had before. Um, but, you know, super interested to hear from somebody really in the trenches, understanding, you know, day to day, you know, the, the rises and falls and what's going on. And, you know, they obviously have a business that goes far beyond uh, Bitcoin as well in the digital asset space. So looking forward to hearing uh, and learning more about that. And with that, I will turn it over to uh, Matthew. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Lou, for the opportunity to meet all you. Um, I think I'll, I'll cover kind of three broad topics. One is kind of introduction of uh, myself and Van Eck. Second is uh, how we're, we are framing the kind of Bitcoin and digital assets opportunity for clients. And then the third is uh, how um, a little more specifics around how we're managing uh, some of these uh, actively managed strategies where frankly, we would uh, love your partnership. Um, so Vanak is a, a family owned asset manager with approximately $100 billion in assets. Uh, the firm has its DNA in hard money. So Jan Van Eck is the CEO. He, he runs and owns the firm. His dad started the company in 1955. Uh, he was going to uh, business school at night, learning Austrian economics, uh, launched an international mutual fund, which at the time was quite innovative. Uh, and in the late 60s, uh, got conviction that inflation was going to accelerate and the gold peg would not hold. And he pivoted that international mutual fund into essentially all gold mining stocks, which was a home run in the 1970s, really built this firm. Uh, and when Jan, uh, his son, who now owns and runs the firm, discovered Bitcoin, uh, he uh, realized that it could be an important hedge on our gold exposure. And we were the first to file, first among the kind of TradFi ETF issuers to file for a Bitcoin ETF. When that uh, couldn't get off the ground because of regulatory reasons. Jan started writing checks in, well, of course he bought Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, but he also started writing checks into venture. Uh, and we are LPs and I'd say uh, a handful of kind of crypto venture VCs. We're not a VC. Uh, we specialize in liquid uh, investments, but we use those investments, specifically one strategic partnership with Cadenza, which is an early stage manager in the 
space to build our network and intelligence, share deal flow. Uh, and then uh, I joined in 2021 and we started broadening out the product suite. So digital assets, about 1.5 billion of our 100 billion. We think it's going to reach 10 to 15 percent of assets, uh, hopefully by the end of this cycle. Uh, and we have we offer 19 different uh, digital asset strategies. The ones that you're most familiar with are the Bitcoin ETF, obviously in the US. We also have spot BTC and ETH products in Europe where uh, regulation is more favorable. Uh, we have some crypto baskets like a top five basket in, in the EU. Uh, we have some equity ETFs in the US that uh, buy pure plays in the space like Coinbase and MicroStrategy. Uh, and then where I spend uh, the bulk of my time is on uh, liquid token strategies. We have two uh, in the US, one is a classic hedge fund, 2 and 20, uh, digital assets alpha, predominantly exposed to L2s and dApps, I'd say like 80% L2s and dApps, 20% L1s. Uh, and then the second actively managed strategy, which I manage, is more of a smart beta uh, approach, which owns a basket of layer ones uh, and tries to beat an index uh, of smart contract platforms that we that we developed. And so that fund is like the inverse. It's 80% L1s and 20% um, L2s and DAPs and uh, charges a very different type of fee as an exposure vehicle. It's one and a half percent all in versus the kind of a hedge fund more like two and 20. Um, our general thesis in this space, which I'm sure all of you are quite aware of and probably agree with, is that uh, open source digital assets are a de minimis portion of global equity markets that they will take market share uh, over the coming decade, that less than 1% of the liquid token projects will generate 99% of the returns. So we, as a manufacturer of intelligent investment solutions, we want to buy, hold, and risk manage various portfolios uh, comprised of these winners. And I think one, um, when, when the asset class was first born, and even now, uh, the way that institutional investors got it into their portfolio was through venture. Uh, and just to give you kind of some perspective, there's been $26 billion invested in so-called blockchain VC since 2020. Uh, that is uh, JP Morgan's estimates. The liquid token universe is now north of $2 trillion. And as LPs and uh, quite a number of these uh, venture funds, what we find when looking at the statements is that their uh, diversification, you know, may be working against them. So the typical blockchain VC fund uh, owns, you know, more than a third uh, in illiquid equity, uh, owns another 15% in illiquid tokens. And then you find these VC funds with, you know, big positions in Ethereum or Arweave or Filecoin or what have you, uh, you know, tokens that are uh, quite liquid with quite a lot of volatility and just wonder whether they're doing the best to harvest all the alpha from what is a very volatile asset class when, you know, that most of their day-to-day is talking to founders, uh, writing seed checks, and then they're kind of monitoring the, these liquid portions. And in contrast to that, if you look at our two liquid token funds, they're basically um, 90 percent plus liquid uh, either all tokens with a handful of small caps or a mix of liquid tokens equities like like coinbase um, and then there'll be you know small slivers of, of illiquid stuff and we we're, we think that as the asset class matures digital assets generally uh, allocators will start to differentiate more between VC and and liquid token funds and they're really quite different business models uh, as we see it. VCs are making lots of small investments, uh, hoping that a couple of them hit and then they double down on those winners. And it may be three to five years before you can get your money back. They're also hunting generally in quite small cap between kind of 40 and 400 million is the sweet spot for the market caps of, uh, of venture investments. In, in the liquid token funds, uh, we're, as I mentioned, we think 1% of these projects are going to take 99% of the value. So we want to own uh, concentrated positions in category winners. And then uh, we're, we're global. Uh, we trade out of New York, uh, Amsterdam. Um, 
we want to maintain very active management uh, to kind of keep our ideal uh, position sizes of these call options. Uh, and then we offer quarterly liquidity to LPs uh, at the NAV. So it's a, a more liquid uh, uh, opportunity. So we'll see, uh, you know, so far institutions have not allocated to this space, full stop. Um, and it, here's kind of an interesting couple of charts that for me really highlight the divergence. Uh, so this is a Bloomberg survey, uh, US institutional equity trading survey, 2024. Uh, are you invested in, in crypto assets? 7% uh, say yes, up from 1% year over year. So a lot of growth, but still very low base. I wonder who these 6% are who, who don't know. Um, and the, these are like, you, you know, a, a lot of the traditional buy side here could be uh, banks or broker owned asset managers. Uh, that's at least my assumption. Um, and then here's a survey from the CFA Institute and uh, percentage of organizations currently investing in cryptocurrencies, 94% of state and government plan sponsors. What? Uh, like to me, that doesn't make any sense unless these folks are counting, you know, every uh, seed sage venture investment that they've made, or maybe everyone has a small uh, position in A16Z. Like that's also a possibility. But I think it just highlights the huge divergence between what family offices and sovereign wealth funds can do with their money and what the classic buy side broker and bank owned asset management in the US. That's our typical, Vanex typical client base is our you know, registered and regulated investment advisors like those under the umbrella of a Morgan Stanley or a UBS or a Raymond James. Uh, and those entities, you know, have been very slow to embrace the Bitcoin ETF uh, and they're not allocating in their, in their macro strategies. Um, we're hopeful that that is going to change. Uh, we've had, you know, very encouraging conversations. I, I had a conversation with um, J.P. Morgan a couple of weeks ago, where um, they admitted that, uh, despite Jamie Dimon's public comments. Um, they've accelerated their plans to onboard Bitcoin ETFs. They had been planning to wait one to two quarters uh, and because of client interest, it's been accelerated to ASAP. Um, and we're kind of hearing that across the space and think that the next wave of flows uh, you know, may come from uh, institutions and funds like these ones, BlackRock Global Allocation, BlackRock Strategic Income Opportunities, Strategic Global Bond Fund, uh, Asset Mark is a publicly traded company that um, is a customer of Vanex. They're buying a model strategy from us called Thematic Disruption Strategy. It has a 5% weight to Bitcoin. Um, uh, and then there'll be a number of ETFs uh, that are going to come live outside of the US, UK, uh, Hong Kong, and Brazil, uh, India. So it's really, I think the ETF wrapper is unlocking uh, a lower total cost of ownership for Bitcoin. It's just a, an, it's like an API directly into the TradFi world, mainlining a Bitcoin only exchange uh, into the brokerage accounts of, of every American. Um, and that's a, tr that's a very large in lock. But if you look at the average trade tickets, they've been quite small. Uh, so, it, you know, we think it's coming from retail slash uh, prosumer. Um, uh, let's see, what else can I show you? Oh, okay. So, um, it, how we look at the space generally, um, we think that that Bitcoin is distinct because there are you know now five sovereign nations that are mining Bitcoin for their own account. Ethiopia just in February, uh, the most recent, to kind of admit that. Uh, a good use of the stranded energy from all the hydro that they're building is um, uh, to mine Bitcoin. And it, when we recommend allocations to clients, we're usually recommending something in the you know one to five percent range, depending on the client. And then half of that plus, uh, we would recommend going into a bit Bitcoin specifically through a mix of a cold storage or and or the ETF. Uh, and my personal view is that the institutional adoption is more likely to come from frontier and emerging markets mining Bitcoin for their own account rather than waiting for someone like JP Morgan Chase to actually offer you the ability to own Bitcoin in your Chase account. That seems to be many, many years away. Uh, 
Uh, so, uh, you know, put, we put half into Bitcoin and then we put half or so into um, one of our two private funds. And we are trying to take a fundamental view with these funds by really tracking what are the economics that are being generated by the blockchain, where are the users and fees, and then um, we make we do discounted cash flow analysis where we will assume uh, that a given blockchain can uh, can achieve like a dominant market share in its category. Uh, we size the category. Um, we look at the take rate that is possible, uh, and that's different uh, depending on the blockchain. And then we're DCFing this for you know five to seven years, taxing it, uh, and trying to get a gauge of what's our kind of upside, base case, downside, how does the risk reward look for a given project, given how their KPIs look, and then position sizing um, uh, very carefully. And that's one thing I learned from coming from equities is just the position sizing, given the volatility in the space, uh, very challenging and a big uh, adjustment. Um, so this is just like a snapshot of how we look at uh, layer one blockchains, fees, market share. You can see Ethereum was 80% of fees a year and a half ago. Um, it's lost a lot of market share to Bitcoin uh, because of the way that the token is constructed for Bitcoin. It's the miners that earn that fees, not the token holders. Um, so th that type of educational process to uh, tell clients how that just simply how that works. Um, we spend time on that. Uh, and then um, in, it, as we look at how to, com how to compose portfolios of these assets, um, one of the first uh, things that we did when I joined was just to do a simple taxonomy of the space into the types of uh, sectors that you might see the S&P, say, divided into 10 easy to understand uh, use case driven sectors. Uh, and then as we did that work and then dug into the top coins on each, for, for my fund at least, we, we kind of got conviction that layer one uh, smart contract platforms led by Ethereum is really the only sector appropriate for a more, um, a more algorithmic approach where you're ba where you're buying and staking and risk managing uh, these kind of larger cap liquid tokens and your chance of going to zero is maybe lower than some of the app level and then you know we're, we're taking a kind of fat protocol thesis approach with uh, smart contract leaders um, and that 80 20 mix of, of layer ones and dapps uh, whereas in the liquid token fund um, we're you know playing around more with um, kind of web three names, gaming, deep in, those types of projects will get uh, larger uh, larger position sizes. But but really, you know, the, the core principle here is that the token is not the product. We don't buy meme coins uh, unless there's something um, in the product roadmap that might generate real, real value. We're looking for pro projects that have quantifiable benefits versus legacy systems, uh, great uh, doxed teams, um, network effects, and where the token uh, either has a cash flow based uh, value accrual or where we can get confidence that it that it may in the in the future. Um, so I think I've done 15 minutes. We're you know we're lucky and maybe half luck, partially luck and skill, but both of these funds were able to outperform Bitcoin uh, after fees uh, last year, which according to Galaxy, that puts them in the top five percent. Um, off to a good start this year. And uh, yeah, we'd love to take any any of your questions. I'll just give you my background also because I didn't do that. It's uh, I had some twists and turns. I started out as a news reporter at Bloomberg and CNBC uh, 20 years ago. I think I was early to recognize the phenomenon of fake news and uh, mm -hmm. being, being jealous of my uh, sources who all had bigger balance sheets than me, got my CFA, and spent four years uh, working for Kathy Wood at Alliance Bernstein before the ARC days, learned a lot about how to generate conviction around long-term open source disruption. I also learned a lot about uh, things I didn't want to do when managing money. Um, and there was too much turnover, too much conviction around trading the quarters, and I wanted a, a, a more buy and hold approach. So I uh, left her, spent 10 years on the sell side, equity, sales and trading and research, and joined Act three years ago. Okay. Well, that was terrific. I, I mean, I guess it was um, a ton of information. It's, you know, 
talking about it in you know it, it's such a highly sophisticated way that you, you really don't hear very often so uh so really appreciate it i'll start off with a few questions and i'm sure we'll have you know lots from uh, uh, other community members first is you talked about you know how you know and obviously these are somewhat squishy numbers but it went from one percent to seven percent of institutions investing. Were you able to learn anything like who, you know, what was special about those institutions that they went in that then gave you any insight into what's coming? In talking to Coinbase, who we're very close with, Coinbase is the, uh, while they're not the custodian for our Bitcoin ETF, that's Gemini, I do use Coinbase Prime quite a bit. And they, they, they said, um, family offices and hedge funds uh, were the new participants. Um, you can also see from the kind of regulated futures activity on the CME that a lot of these kind of trend following commodity, uh, trend following hedge funds uh, also um, new and larger participants in the space and the ETF offers probably some ability to better ability to hedge. So, um, what we haven't, what I who I don't think has shown up yet are the uh, classic investment advisors um, who are either following a 60-40 model uh, that's been developed by the Morgan Stanley chief investment officer. <laughs> like there are there are a lot of assets tied to those types of models where the, that that macro view trickles down to the advisor, uh, and he might tweak things by a, you know a little bit here and there, um, but those advisors can't, still can't buy Bitcoin in for the discretionary part of their funds. Uh, they have to wait for the phone to call from their client who's like, I know you're managing me according to the 60-40 thing, but I really want it to be 60-39-1. Uh, and those folks are buying Bitcoin, but it, those are reverse inquiries, but uh, not on a, on a discretionary basis. Interesting. Um, so, you know, the... You know, how you spend your time too. Uh, are you spending your time educating people or are you waiting for them to to learn? Because you know, how do you really educate people? They, and, you know, I, I believe people have to learn. I try and, to incentivize people to learn. Um, but you know, obviously you've got a lot of resources. Yeah, that, I mean, on the one hand, uh, you know, if you don't have time if you don't get it or don't have time, I'm not gonna, you know, and I don't have time to educate you. There's part of that um, where, you know, definitely it's not my favorite thing to do Bitcoin 101 calls. And we try to get kind of folks who are closer to the customer to do that stuff. Um, but what, you know, what we're trying to do is put out high quality research and education in the space on a kind of predictable basis. So this is an example of a monthly periodical that we put out called uh, Bitcoin chain check, where we basically just taken a lot of Glassnode and other data and um, kind of fundamental Bitcoin metrics and looking at them on 30-day average, 30-day change, 365-day change. And then we do a percentile. Where is it in the last 30 days versus its all-time history? And the here's one where we actually took action and, and created some alpha in the space, but a percent of BTC addresses in profit. Uh, it hit 90% in February. If you go back and look at the chart, you see every time that you hit 90% of addresses in profit, you basically hit 100% in short order. Mm -hmm. So our call was, yes, it's overbought, but we, we're going to stay aggressively positioned and we're going to hit an all-time high. And um, you know that happened. We, we also were able to use data like that, uh, conversely, to take risk off in the, in the hedge fund. Um, it's a directional long strategy. So we'll go anywhere from 50% long to 100% long. We noticed that funding rates are, were highly elevated. Uh, like right before the Bitcoin ETF. So my colleague who manages that strategy brought risk down right as the ETFs came to market and then just redeployed on that first dump and saved uh, quite a bit of, of performance. So um, I think that to your answer your question directly, Lou, there's tons of no coiners out there, tons. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I, like, I don't think we're changing that many people's minds with the high prices. Uh, I think it, it there's just as 
pretty much just as much hate. But it's like the presidential election. You only need to change, you know, a few hundred people in Ohio and that that flips the whole thing. Uh, and that's similar to how Bitcoin works, because, you know, you don't get more supply when when the demand goes higher. So you just want to slowly <laughs> increase the number of people DCAing. That's the whole game, in my view, is just each day uh, one more person who's DCAing. Uh, and, and, and that's how Bitcoin is inevitable. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. It feels yeah, to me, I, I describe it as a community. I'm pretty sure there are going to be more community members tomorrow. Um, so a uh, first question is from Oz. Hey, Lou, thanks. Um, that was a great presentation. I had a, a couple of questions, uh, really more around the um, 60391 thesis. Uh, what are you guys looking at and, and advising around um, mining companies, ordinals, and then crypto derivatives that, that seem to be starting to pop up now that we've got, you know, more matriculation of like the Lightning Network and, and other technologies that are out there. And do you see those types of investments or assets to be something that, you know, at least at your level that would be either looked at or recommended inside of, you know, maybe the next three years? Sure, I'll take that. Um, so... We do have an ETF, uh, tickers DAPP, which owns pure play equities in the space. And mining stocks are a big component of that. Uh, and there's more than $100 million in that fund. And as always, a good chunk of that is VanX because we uh, aggressively eat our own cooking. And we, we seeded our Bitcoin ETF with $72 million of our own money, which was three times the largest seed of anyone else. So that's a... a, a uh, di diversion, but it, when it comes to the mining companies, it, we have that exposure vehicle, but we do not um, own those stocks in any of our actively managed portfolios yet. Uh, and I, we did write a piece like a year and a half ago on the corporate governance at the Bitcoin mining companies. The executive compensation has been egregious and we vote our proxies very carefully. We have a whole team on that and they really stood out as kind of wasting shareholder money and the capital allocation of the listed Bitcoin miners You know, last cycle left a lot to be desired um, just in terms of total debt taken on and then also communicating that uh, to uh, the investment community. So they they really you know got aggressive with shareholder compensation and dilution and debt. Um, and structurally, we wonder uh, how easy it's going to be to um, to pick the, the Bitcoin miners in that's in the space. That said, since the bottom of the cycle and a lot of these miners went bankrupt and restructured their debt, uh, th there is a lot less uh, debt overall. And um, maybe some discipline has been brought into um, the space. And I actually just put out a tweet this morning um, suggesting kind of a, a tactical uh, uh, purchase here. Wait, I'll actually show it for you guys. Um, Cause there, I, I think tactically there's, um, a number of reasons to be excited, but an equal weighted index of the top five U.S. Bitcoin miners is down 8% year to date versus BTC up 62, ETH up 56, SOL up 103%. And he here's kind of the chart, which is this is the, the yellow line is the uh, index of the top five Bitcoin miners equally weighted. This is the Bitcoin price, um, you know, break even for the, the listed universe is about 43,000. So every day that we're up here above 60 and closer to the halving, I think tactically, um, you know, it raises a, a good entry point for, for miners. Uh, the other thing, here's the total market cap of listed miners. It reached an all time, I think there's a structural growth here. Um, because of a better access to the capital markets and less debt this cycle, but we got kind of overheated in terms of listed miners market cap to their proven reserves. Isn't it amazing? JP, even JP Morgan uh, measures, uh, values Bitcoin miners on proved reserves, right? Hey, Jamie Dimon, take a look. Um, so that's come down now more in the normal range. I think you've got a, a, a tactical opportunity, but, um, you know, the, the capital management of these companies, uh, let's see. Yeah, 
Thanks, Gabby, um, Just uh, one, one last question. Hey, um, hey, Oz, oh, Oz, sorry, you mentioned you... ordinals. I can get it. Sorry, on ordinals, um, for, for me, running, I was the index that I'm benchmarked to is X Bitcoin. Uh, mm -hmm. It's an index of layer ones. And when I when ordinals came out last year, um, I, I saw it as a game changer, and, and continue to think that is something which makes Ethereum's differentiation less versus Bitcoin. So I added Bitcoin to my strategy. It's not a huge weight, but uh, it, I think it's meaningful um, and it's good for the miners uh, long term. And then on crypto derivatives, uh, we don't play there. Uh, we don't like the counterparty risk. We're long, we're long the space. We're not going to short. Uh, it's too much counterparty risk, too much room for unlimited losses. So we're going to wait for that market to mature. Uh, and you know we want audited financials from all our counterparties, all that stuff. You can't get that uh, in crypto. Mm -hmm. And we don't we don't do on chain with with client assets either. I should say that because um, we're SEC regulated and uh, you can't put other people's money into a smart contract if you're an SEC regulated uh, asset manager in New York right now. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Oz. Dara. Yeah, thank you. Really great presentation. So I, I'm just curious, what, just going back to a couple of points that you made regarding RIAs and uh, camp buying for discretionary accounts and, and some of the new buyers coming in. I'd be curious of, of your thoughts and especially what you're seeing with respect to uh, retail investors. I mean, I love that you guys have, you know, this diversified fund of, of digital assets, but right now retail investors can't participate in that. So what are you, are, you know, what are your thoughts on, you know, maybe are, are you looking into maybe other structures that you could uh, enable some of those retirement dollars to flow into or some retail investors to come into some of these more diversified type of funds? Uh, that's really a question for, you know, Gary Gensler and his bosses, mm -hmm. Joe Biden and Elizabeth yeah. Warren. Um, <laughs> you know, the, it's so ironic that uh, I would argue that last cycle, last crypto cycle was derailed uh, because of Three Arrows Capital uh, kicking off and Terra Luna, you know, but Three Arrows Capital kicking off a wave of bankruptcies in the space. And those wouldn't have happened if GBTC hadn't have flipped from 100% premium to a 50% discount and caused a whole wave of collateral calls across the space. If there had been an ETF, that would have never happened. Um, so, yeah, uh, it, we'll, we'll, you know, there is no way to get exposure in your 401k to um, a diversified portfolio of crypto assets if you live in, in the U.S. Maybe that'll but change. They are doing that overseas, so there, there's there, even even um, you know beyond some of the major cryptocurrencies, there's there's more uh, opportunity to invest in in these type of fund structures. Yes, um, so Europe has been more lax about this. And it's really the German regulator, Boffin, who uh, has taken the lead, but it still has to be a top 50 or so mm -hmm. asset okay. by market cap. Uh, so we have a, a, a fund called VTOP, uh, which trades in Germany and Switzerland, which is top five kind of coins rebalanced. I don't think that there's a ton of appetite in the space for that degree of passive management. I think people want a slightly more active hand on the wheel. So we haven't had tremendous flows into that. And then in the US, it's the lack of the regulated futures market. If if there could be listed futures on Solana, then um, it'd be hard to make the argument you could bring an ETF. But if you talk to the CME, you know, they say they won't, you know, even try on a listed Solana futures until the regulator changes and we get some clarity. So hopefully Coinbase is going to have this suit tossed out or part of it, um, yeah. but, uh, or, or a new, a new president. Uh, do you, do you envision, or are you, are you thinking that a new administration and will, will open up these type of structures for retail investors? Um, Kind of, kind of. Uh, uh, it, 
the uniparty uh, is not that pro crypto, right? When it uh-huh. comes to the nuts and bolts of like, are you going to pass the Patriot Act or are you going to, you know, come out in favor of Bitcoin? Like most lawmakers go with the with the former. Uh, so we have to just remind ourselves every day: this is an emerging market asset class, this is a frontier market asset class, this is the anti-dollar. We're not going to get caught up in getting too bearish on what's going on with U.S. regulation because a greater and greater percentage of the world uh, doesn't care about U.S regulation. Um, and I just, uh, here's one chart that just really I love so much. Uh, it's a survey, um, Bitcoin outlook by country, optimistic, skeptical, or neither. Uh, optimistic, Nigeria, India, Vietnam, Argentina. Uh, mm-hmm. Skeptical, Japan, Germany, France. Yeah. You, this is where <laughs> young people live over here on the left. This is where old people live over here on the right. <laughs> uh, it's like it's kind of as simple as that. And if you take too much of a developed market view, you're going to get too bearish. Well, the last administration did open right. up through the the um, Department of Labor opportunities into private equities. So, I mean, if there is more of a, you know, of a mindset to expand and and diversify for, for, you know, retire, you know, retirement portfolios. So, you know, fingers crossed, maybe I think they do need some education on, you know, on, on digital assets and cryptocurrencies, but I think we could get there. Yeah, yeah okay. don't get me wrong. I mean, I think it'd be amazing if, if there yeah. was an administration change. And the first thing that w- what uh, what we're hearing is that the easiest and first thing for the new administration to change is at the OCC and just making it easier for banks specifically to custody digital assets. And that would probably be a big unlock for just Bitcoin, I think, specifically. Uh, I'll give a quick shout out that uh, Jan Van Eck um, established at USC, the Van Eck Digital Assets Initiative, which is an educational curriculum for students at the Marshall School of Business. And they're having a digital assets, Van Eck, USC Digital Assets Conference next week, uh, this week, actually, Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday, I'm interviewing Brian Brooks, and I'm going to ask him these very questions. Uh He's former chairman of the OCC, uh, you know, could be a could, could, could return to that role, could, could be in any number of roles uh, if we get a, a red wave. Oh, look, I, I just connected on LinkedIn. That's, I'd love in, information on that. That's great. Thank sure. you so much. Thanks, Dara. Okay, Kyle, you're next. Hey, yeah, I'll keep it quick. Um, Brian <laughs> Brooks probably has some interesting things to say about Binance as well. Um, but yeah, I'll keep it quick because uh, there's a lot of hands. Uh, just, yeah, how are you guys looking at the halving coming up? Just a simple question. Uh, most of the Bitcoin gains over the cycle tend to come in the year subsequent to the halving. Uh, So, uh, and and if you look at, once we make multi-year highs, like we just did, you tend to get three to six, 20% drawdowns uh, over the next year, but we linger at that 100% of the network in profit for generally a year. So I'm just trying to Pavlovian condition myself to buy dips right now, unless something dramatically changes. Um, Okay, great. Next is uh, Pamela. Hey, Matthew, thank you so much. I look forward to participating at USC this week. So I'm very excited for the event. Uh, My question is very specific around real world assets. Uh, I'm the CEO and founder of Title Chain. We've been focused on tokenizing real world assets and trying to get some clarity, which uh, some progressive things have, have happened. I don't know if you know, the SEC just approved the transfer protocol, um, asset protocol with uh, Fairmint. So we can, we're actually doing a live launch right now. So we can actually take USDC, which is very exciting. They're a transfer agent. So my question is twofold, is you have traditional financial assets that everyone's talking about tokenizing, which is not really where the exciting, whether it's treasuries or bonds or whatever. Um, but when you look at the marketplace of physical, right, whether it's real estate or um, other uh, opportunities of rare earth minerals in, in ground, um, you've got, a, I think, 100 million square foot of real estate in New York City that's empty. Um, you've got a lot of banks that are, are on the edge here. So looking at a auction type basket of these, these assets, where, where do you personally see that hap- going? And where are you guys seeing the data right now that's showing the opportunity for these trillions 
of real world assets that will be coming on chain. Yeah, congrats on your uh, on your Very momentum tight. there. Um, I have to say that we have been much less constructive on real world assets. Um, it, it's basically just an opportunity cost of capital. Uh, our call is that the open source uh, databases are, you know, 50 basis points of global finance and they're going to be 5% and uh, Bitcoin is the purest way to express that. And then there's other smart contract platforms and dApps. And um, some, some of the uh, real world asset that you mentioned, like treasuries and you know, traditional stuff, you have to be enormous scale to make money at that right now. And the demand really won't materialize until Bitcoin is, you know, 250K anyway, and the tech stack is commoditized. So let's just hold back and be a fast follower in that space. Uh, and then when it comes to like the long tail of real world assets that you mentioned, whether it's real estate or whiskey barrels or IP, uh, 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 a lot of those assets are lower turnover generally, uh, and so they're not going to be a huge driver of, of trading volumes, and we can just observe every cycle. It's really the trading volumes uh, right. that is the driver. Uh, so we personally, I'm expressing like real world asset exposure through some of the smart contract platforms that are onboarding projects, you know, like uh, something like an Avalanche, Avax token. Um, I, th I think they've just done a, a pretty good job at finding some interesting real world asset projects and from a biz dev perspective, onboarding them. I'm not sure that that really accrues to the Avax token in any great way. You know, you only have to stake 2000, you don't have to use it for gas. Uh, but if we do get, you know, a thousand of these quasi public private chains and folks are able to use, move back and forth between the permissionless and the permissioned, uh, then I think that the smart contract platforms will, will benefit and my dollar is best spent there rather than trying to tokenize some uranium or onboard some media business that I don't have expertise in. Right. No, thank you. That's great. Okay. Thanks, Pamela. Next question is Zulfi. Thank you, Lou. Appreciate it. Uh, man, Matthew, thank you for taking the time and really appreciate the presentation. My question was going to be around the deep in space. And yeah, I just wanted to ask if uh, there are like any given verticals or, or dApps within the deep in space that you're excited about. Yeah, um, we have been public with a handful of our investments uh, in the space. Um, I, I'd say they're more rifle shots than categories. Um, from my perspective, uh, the, the deep in projects are very early stage, very high risk. Uh, you know, they are kind of small percentages of uh, the funds that we're running. But with that said, um, we like some of the Solana based projects like Hive Mapper, which is a mapping protocol that's trying to compete with Google Maps. Um, I've got a dash cam in my car uh, and I'm as I drive, it's mapping my environment and I'm mining these honey tokens and maybe someday the next Uber or Lyft or business that is a customer of Google Maps will decide to license this uh, data from HiveMapper instead for which they would need honey tokens. So we took a, what we like to do is um, we like to watch a, a really exciting project launch. And when there's a lot of froth in it, uh, we don't we don't buy it right when it launches. And we kind of wait for that trough of disillusionment that happens <laughs> with a lot of new technologies. And then we uh, look to buy the token. So Hive Mapper came to market like a year and a half ago at 10 cents. Uh, it was too expensive for us, but we had done a lot of work on it. When the token fell to a penny last summer, we, we bought some in a private sale. Uh, uh, we're still locked up in that, uh, but it's now 20 cents. Um, so that, that's one project that we have uh, invested in. Um, I um, There's a handful of others. I'm hesitant to name them because they're kind of small cap. And, um, but the, it, it's a very logical, I think, way to bring real world use case to blockchains, but it's also very difficult to separate what's uh, real from what's fake. I guess Render and Helium are two of the others that we've uh, disclosed publicly. 
Um, I see a question from Sarsen, oh. or let, I just want to an answer this question on the in the chat on the segment. Um, so we have uh, built uh, an NFT solution. Uh, one of my colleagues, Matt Bartlett, is uh, NFT DGen and he identified uh, some gaps in kind of the existing fractionalization uh, of NFTs and has built uh, a fractionalization engine using ERC-1155 uh, structure where you can uh, create a set of keys for your NFT and then sell those keys. Uh, and then in order to redeem the full NFT back, you'd have to buy back all of the keys. Uh, and he thinks this is going to uh, help folks um, kind of help make NFTs more liquid. Uh, and it, it would also, if you own the, um, uh, it helps facilitate airdrops as well. Uh, so we built that on, on mainnet, um, just went live, would love your guys' feedback on it. Uh, probably going to be expanding that to layer twos uh, shortly, and you know, happy to make the intro to Matt Bartlett to for anyone who's building in the space. There may all be, there may also be some real world asset uh, utility from this type of structure. Terrific. Next question from Ferris. Hey Matt, uh, awesome stuff. Uh, curious, who are you partnered with uh, within the ecosystem? So segmented via vertical, like infra providers, all the way over to uh, blockchains. Yep. Uh, so in the fund, the fund that I manage is a Delaware partnership. Uh, it's onshore. We're really uh, following the SEC custody rule. So our counterparties are uh, limited and we use uh, Coinbase and Gemini for custody. Uh, we trade on, uh, on Kraken also. Uh, the hedge fund is uh, Cayman. Uh, entity with an onshore offshore feeder and as a result can trade on offshore exchanges we trade on binance okx um, that fund has also onboarded with a handful of um, institutional market makers like falcon x nonco um, mostly holding coins with Anchorage, uh, which is a, fe a federally chartered uh, bank, also Coinbase Prime with that one. Uh, you know, the SEC custody rule really limited our uh, self-custody ability. We had been, uh, um, we wrote our own self-custody policy. We were uh, using Fireblocks for a lot of assets. And then it really just, the risk is, is too high with the current uh, regulatory regime. So it makes sense to bring those coins to the uh, qualified custodians, Anchorage, Gemini. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't think, I don't, uh, oh, I mean, I guess we could talk about w what we use for data because on that, the research team is, uh, we're terrible customers. We, we buy data from everyone and then cancel all the time. Uh, like all the solutions are at the one hand, they're great, but they have their holes. I'd say uh, we're kind of more loyal to um, Dune Analytics, Artemis, uh, uh, Glassnode, Nansen, the Thai. Um, those are some of our, I guess, more loyal relationships on the data side. Oh, uh, Vanek owns um, a stake in CC Data. Uh, the the uh, uh, CC data used to be called uh, Crypto Compare, uh, which is a calculation agent essentially. Um, so we use the we, we buy we buy data from them. Yeah, uh, not something I was too terribly surprised on the, on the infra side with the Anchorage. I mean, just hearing that over and over from the folks like Franklin and nobody's uh, the self custody world is very has become fraught. Um, <laughs> yeah, but but would love to. Pick your brain uh, on a sidebar and a couple of world uh, points on HFTs and other things, if I could. Sure. Thanks. Okay. Next question is from Julie. Hi, I'm Julie. Great presentation. Thank you, Matthew. It's uh, always refreshing coming on, getting a 
bit of wisdom and learning along the way. I am a head of events for the Collective and Crypto Mondays. I call myself a bougie degen and the frontline normie <laughs> out here. So these are all self-proclaimed titles. The reason I say this is there was something that came up at the beginning of the call talking about institutional investors and a conversation I had with a pretty big one. And the conversation that was overarching in the macro comment was egg on our face. What's interesting is then through this presentation, the conversation about a different administration or a previous administration or the limitations in the current administration. And again, that feeling of egg on the face comes in because as a woman, the pre previous administration stacked the Supreme Court so much so that I do not have the right to my body in some states that I go into. So if I'm living in Texas, I don't have the right to my body, but I can buy crypto. But then I look and I see on the current administration, obviously, you know, those changes have not been made, but there's a really strong crypto regulation. My question goes back to the first part of this, which is, um, you know, how do we as this frontline normie understand what's going on, help our friends, perhaps either on either side of the aisle, understand the crypto conversation. And moreover, those institutions that feel like they might have egg on their face by buying in and doing this with, you know, I, I want all of our rights to be able to be, um, you know, deci decided by us with some level of regulation. How do we get through all of these different roadblocks that are coming from different, you know, we've got the this administration, current administration, past administration, and then we've got the potential of the regulation or, um, you know, our more financial institutions that people look to for, you know, strength and solidarity. How do we break through this? Yeah, I like to highlight that in a world where there is less and less that we can all agree on, uh, the things that are easy to agree on actually become more valuable. Um, so, I mean, I think that's very notable in who's, you know, there's a lot of Bitcoin buying has come from the Middle East, right? Like I disagree with a lot of people in the Middle East about uh, the facts on the ground in the world, but we all agree in the next 10 minutes, Bitcoin block is going to beat. And so, uh, you know, that's that's very valuable. And um, that's how I try to onboard people is that it's a beacon of, of stability in a very um, unstable world. Um, does like that answer that. your question? <laughs> Yeah, I, I thank you for the uh, inspiration. I, I try to I walk a similar line, but uh, you said it much more eloquently. Okay, thanks, Julie. Uh, John, hi there, guys. Hey, Matt. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks for commenting on Segment.io. We've been watching that project a little bit. Um, I wanted to ask you for some more clarity around what you were saying about your restrictions against entering a smart contract with like investor money. Does that does that mean that you can't trade on DEXs as, as like a 40 act product? Or what does this mean, you know, in practical terms? Correct. We cannot trade on DEXs. So like a project like a, a, a honey token, you would do a private placement or would that not be eligible for your 40 act funds? Um, so these, these uh, token funds are not the private funds, uh, the Alpha Fund and my Smart Beta Fund, they're not 40 Act funds. They, it's Delaware Partnership or uh, BVI Offshore Entity. Um, so th those, it's not about yeah, it's not about 40 Act or not. It's about who is holding the coins. They have to be able to be custodied by a qualified custodian namely Anchorage or Gemini or Coinbase. Um, so a honey token can be, it's a Solana based token. I can hold it in Coinbase Prime, uh, no problem. Um, sometimes we have to go shopping um, over, like it's very much case specific. Some custodians can hold some coins, some exchanges can hold other coins. We might have to go over here to buy the coin and then we move it over there where it can be custodied. Uh, so that that's the, the variable. Um, that the custodians have to be uh, so-called qualified custodians, which is, in practical purposes, it means a, a special purpose trust that's bankruptcy remote and regulated by New York Department of Financial Services. And then they give the okay, basically, on what coins can be custodied by those qualified custodians, or they give an okay for a process. Uh, and then the custodian can kind of get some leeway uh, on the specific coin as long as they're following a, a documented process. Um, 
So holding coins is generally not a problem. And the custodians will, if we say, hey, we've got a million dollars of demand for this token, it's just an SPL token. Can you please set it up? Okay, fine, they'll, they'll do that. But if we wanted to go and be a liquidity provider on Uniswap with client money, we can't do that. Um, that makes sense. Is it typically that your alpha fund will like uh, explore like projects that aren't in custody yet and then like your your liquid token fund will like do the do like the back the back channel work with the custodian? Um, it, it happens. It happens. It Does happens. the alpha fund have a cu custodian requirement, a custody requirement or not because it's a hedge fund? Uh, it is it's kind of interpretive and we are deciding to hold the coins with a qualified custodian whenever possible, but there are some assets uh, on fireblocks in that, in that product. That's interesting. We, we have some private placement vehicles here and we're always kind of trying to figure out mm -hmm. like at what point is the trade-off not worth it to try to like come into compliance with rules that aren't written yet. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Uh, we uh, can, like, even in the Delaware partnership, when I said we can't be put in a start, smart contract, that's a little bit misleading because I can stake my Ethereum and Solana and all those proof of stake coins straight from Coinbase Prime custody. And that uh, is okay from a regulatory perspective. Uh -huh. uh, nice. in, in, in your um, beta neutral fund, are you mostly working in large caps and like Paris trades or can you kind of unpack a little bit more of the strategy there? Yeah, it's not not beta neutral. It's it's uh, it's a diversified exposure to layer ones. Buy, stake, and risk manage a basket of layer ones, and then try to beat an index that we manufacture just so that the you know we have something to, that to, that clients can expect. It's a one and a half percent all all in fee, no carry. So that's why I describe it as smart beta. Is that you know we we think layer ones are most appropriate for a buy stake and hold portfolio. We're going to actively manage it because of all the pitfalls in the space, because of the regulation, and charge a very reasonable fee for that exposure. That's the the business model of that fund. Okay, well we've reached it, John. Thank thanks. You questions we've uh, reached the top of the hour so really want to thank you for taking the time and you know sharing the wisdom with us obviously there was a tremendous interest so thanks a lot and look forward to you coming back next year and doing it again sure thanks everybody you can find me on linkedin or twitter or dm me talk to you later